Hi everyone, my name is Matilda and I work at Nordkart as the head of AI and I will be talking about how to handle the luxury of having too much training data. So usually when you're working with AI you have the opposite problem. You don't have enough training data and you need to, need to do all these tricks in order to mo make the most out of your data. But when we're working with geographical AI, we sometimes have the opposite problem. We have too much training data, which can also cause problems. So I will be talking about what those problems are and how we have handled them. So lately, there has been a lot of talk about AI. And the development is happening really fast. And a lot of what's going on is really impressive and maybe a little bit scary. Uh, and I think our perception of AI is also shifting a little bit. So um, a definition of AI that I heard on a podcast called Hard Fork is that AI is just what people call stuff that feels magical or not possible with computers. And when it becomes possible, we stop calling it AI. So I think this matches pretty well with how many people uh, think of AI. Like it has to be something magical. We need to feel like a computer shouldn't really be able to do it. It needs to be impressive. And if it's not, well, then we kind of don't think of it as AI anymore. So as things are progressing, I think we're also shifting our um, interpretation and what we really think that AI is. Maybe not uh, the people in this room that much, but I think people outside of IT definitely f uh, feel this a little bit. So AI is really just the tool in order to find some kind of system in your data. So if you're thinking of traditional programming, you have some input data and a program, and you put that into, com into a computer and you get some output. While if you're working with machine learning and AI, instead you have some input data and some output data, and you put that into a computer and the computer creates the program. So that's the short introduction to AI. <laughs> Nordkart is a company that most of you are probably not that familiar with. We're a private software company with around 210 employees. And our focus is on automation of public services that makes use of geographical data. So we're working with all types of application. For example, um, um, solutions for applying for building permissions, both for engineers, architects, but also normal citizens. And we're working with distribution of data. We have our own online shop where you can buy different types of geographical data, like, for example, 3D models. And you can send digital notifications to your neighbors if you're building something. Uh, and we're also working a lot with infrastructure for geographical data, so that data can be updated from the municipalities to the national data sets and available for everyone. So the AI team at Nordkart, our aim is to increase automation by combining the use of AI with geographical data. So we're looking into all the processes that we're working on and trying to figure out how AI fits into that and how it can help automate further. So the focus for us the last year at least has been on analysis of aerial images in order to automatically detect buildings. So I will start by explaining a little bit more about why we're working with this. So how are buildings in maps actually created? Well, changes are notified to the municipality. So when someone builds something on their property, they're supposed to uh, send in an application for a building permit, which allows the municipality to know about the change, and they can update the data. So this is what is supposed to happen. <laughs> but as we all know, people build illegally, they don't always follow the rules, so changes happen without the municipality being notified. But also, in 2015, the politicians decided that residents are actually allowed to build without notifying the municipality if they're building something that is below 50 square meters and uh, as long as it's within the regulation in that area. So, when they are finished building, they are still supposed to notify the municipality and say, I've built this, but that rarely happens. So usually there are a lot of like small garages and greenhouses that are built without the municipality getting notified at all. So there's a second way that changes are being made, and that is by looking at 
uh, what is visible in aerial images and then manually constructing buildings from that. So that means that someone has to sit and manually look through all the aerial images and see where there are differences and try to make the map correspond to what is visible. So why is it important to have correct building data? Well, first of all, due to land use. We need to know how much of our land we're uh, building on, which is important for all types of uh, considerations. For example, flood. It's also important due to taxes. A lot of Norwegian municipalities have property taxes, and those won't be correct unless the building data is. It's important for the fire department in case of emergency, and we also want this data to be correct when we're buying a property or selling a property. But this process of looking at these aerial images and trying to see where there are changes in buildings, it's a very time-consuming job, it's uh, quite expensive, and it, it's not uh, certain that you will see all the changes that have happened. So we need a better way to keep our building's data updated. So can we use AI to automatically detect new buildings? Well, AI is really good at image analysis. It's been good at this for many years, and it's still improving. It can analyze large areas fast. And training data can be created automatically from existing data. So this sounds like a good fit. So that's why we started this project many years ago. So first, I will talk a little bit about our data sources and how and why we can create our training data automatically. So we have aerial images of all of Norway. And from those, we can create small tiles of images. And the reason that we're creating these small, small tiles is because they have the right amount of data to be processed by an AI. So in order for an AI to learn about the buildings, we need to tell it where in this image there are buildings. So we use our existing building data and create what is called a label. And the label tells us where in this image there are buildings and background. And if we add these images on top of each other, we can see that it corresponds really well. So one important detail here is that we're using our existing buildings to label our data, to train a model which then again will find errors in that same data set. And the reason we can do this is that, in general, the, building, the existing building data is really good. Like, the percentage of error is very low, so we can use the data to label and train our model. So we need all sorts of different images of buildings in order for a model to learn what a building looks like. And what the AI will do is try to figure out what is the common denominator between all the buildings that it's seeing. So if we were to uh, train a model on these images, the model would learn, would figure out what is common between these buildings, and that would become its definition of a building. So do you guys think that this is a good selection of images in order to train a model on buildings? People are nodding their heads. <laughs> Why? What is, what is bad about this selection? Yeah, exactly. All the roofs are black and gray. So that would mean that the model would learn that roofs are black or gray. Anything else? Yeah? The grass, the grass is always green. Yeah, this is a very important detail. All these buildings are surrounded by grass. So even though that has nothing to do with the building itself, the AI will learn that for something to be a building, it needs to have grass around it. So we need to be uh, aware of these types of common things in our data set. Because if there is something common, common between all our buildings, the AI will find it, and it will be a part of its definition of a building. So we need a way broader definition with buildings of all types of colors, sizes. We need examples where it's covered by shadow and trees and so on. So when an AI is trained on all of these images and it has learned how a building looks like, you can pass in one of these image tiles, and it will give you its prediction. And the prediction will be a grayscale image where it says how certain it is that each pixel actually is a building. So both these aerial images and the labels are what is called a georeferenced image. 
This means that we have the coordinate for the lower left corner. We also have the size of the image and the pixel size or the spatial resolution, which tells us how much area is covered by each pixel, for example, 10 centimeters. So with all this information, we can figure out where in the real world this image is. And if we can detect a building in this image, we can figure out where in the real world that building is. So this is an important detail into why these images can be utilized for the types of analysis that we do. OK, so we've been working with these types of models for a few years now. And it's been quite a long journey. And uh, there are really two parts to this journey. One is the training data, and the other is the um, models that we're using and the architectures. So I will only cover the training data for this talk. Otherwise, it would be way too long. <laughs> So let's start at the beginning. So I already said that we have uh, aerial images of all of Norway, we have existing buildings for all of Norway, and we can create training data automatically. So let's just create training data for all of Norway. Well, that would give us 146 million tiles, which would be 8.6 terabytes of data. This is quite a lot of data, but some of you might be thinking, well, it's not that much. Isn't AI really about training on large amounts of data? Well, on the training machine that we're using, it would take us 1,703 1, hours for the machine to see all the data once. And that would probably not be enough. It would have to run loops of training and validation. So if you run it for 20 epochs or 20 rounds, it would take 1,419 days, meaning almost four years. So this is a pretty bad idea to just take all the data of Norway. But it's also, um, there's one more problem. The data would be uh, unbalanced. So if we took some random samples of areas of Norway, what would we get? Forest. Some more forest, forest again, some agricultural area, forest, rocks, roads, agriculture, forest. You get my point. Oh, there's one building. <laughs> some ocean, but mainly just nature. Because most of Norway is just nature. In fact, only 1.7% of Norway has buildings. So if we just created data for all of Norway, what would the AI learn? It would learn that everything is not building or background, and it would be 98.3% correct. So the AI would be really happy, we wouldn't. So what we can do is that we can create a so small sample space of Norway and say that, OK, we, we want data from this part. So then we get less data. But we can also include a criteria and say that we only want to create data for the parts of Norway that has, or for the tiles, that has at least 5% building coverage. Which means that this tile would be a part of the data set, but this one would be excluded. OK, so let's look at how the data flows. So we have a, a web map server where the aerial images are saved. And we have our Postgres buildings database. We then create a, a training data generator, uh, which is written in Python, that goes through our sample space tile by tile. It connects to our databases, and it can create the data samples, but only if there are 5% buildings. These samples are then downloaded and saved to our training data set, which is then again split into training, validation, and testing. And this is an important part when you're working with AI. You need to uh, keep some of your uh, data for validation and testing. So when the data is generated and downloaded, we can start training our model, uh, training and valid uh, validating our model in epochs until the model has learned from the data. OK, so let's look at some results from this way of training our model. By genera generating our data from a sample space with the 5% building rule and then training. So this is an example of an area that has been predicted, and the pinkish areas are the detected buildings. So we can see that this works pretty well. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see even better. 
that the AI is able to predict the buildings correctly. One thing that it's not that good at is the shape of the buildings, because this is a per-pixel classification or a segmentation, at its, as it's called. And usually the corners of the building can be a bit more difficult, so it often gets like a round shape. But in general, it's really good at figuring out what is building and what is background. So let, let's look at some numbers. We have a small test area in Kristiansand where we, we have gone through uh, all the building's data and made sure that it's updated and correct. So it's good for testing. And we can see that we find 93.6% of all the buildings. And we have 23 false detections, meaning uh, buildings that are detected by the AI, but that actually is something else. So when we got these results, we were quite happy and thought, OK, let's, let's start making use of these models. This should be able to find new buildings automatically. So we created an application called Eindomscontrol, which means property control, which is a tool for the municipalities to get better updated building information. So we have our AI analysis, which can then run prediction for an entire municipality. And we can compare those results to existing buildings and see what buildings are detected by the AI that is not already in the existing data. And this gives us suggestions of new buildings and building extensions. These data are then fed into an application where the municipality can assess which of these detections are wrong and correct, which then gives us the data set that we really want, which is actual new buildings and new building ex extensions. That can be added to the map. So this is a screenshot of the application. I hope you guys can see all the way in the back. <laughs> um, so here you can see that each of the predictions are presented individually. And you can scroll down and you can see all the predictions that is done for that municipality. You can click into uh, one of the predictions, for example, the first one. And you can see a bit more information. So here you can see which buildings are registered for that property already. But you can also see historical images, which is quite interesting. Because here we can see that in 2020, the building wasn't there. And in 2021, it's definitely there. So this has been built some, sometime between 2020 and 21. So this is a true predictions that you could save. <laughs> this is another one. It's an example of a building extension where the AI detected the area of the building to be bigger than what was in the data already. And this was also then, as you can see from the historical images, built between 2020 and 2021. This is another example, and I think this is my favorite. <laughs> this is a building with grass on the roof, which makes it a bit more difficult to see. And the AI detected that this building is bigger than it's in the data. So if we turn off the detection layer, we can see a bit better. So this detection is definitely correct. The building is bigger. And if you look at the historical image, you can see that it was there in 2012. And if we look even further back, it was also there in 2010. So this is an example of a detection that the AI model uh, predicted, but that was probably overlooked by humans several times. So these are the good detections, but we also have a lot of detections that are deleted. So after we had a few municipalities running this analysis, we saw that around 20% of the predictions were actually correct, and the rest they deleted. And some of what they're deleting kind of looks like buildings, so you can understand that the AI uh, predicted as they did. But other things, like the one in the middle here, is quite obviously not a building. Okay, so. We had our test area in Kristiansand, and this is a quite densely populated area. And we got good results. But what about the rest of the country? <laughs> so we created another test area in Balsfjord, in a much bigger area and also a more varied nature. And what we saw is that in this area, we only had 77% true detections and 300 false detections. This er area was also outside of our sample space. And one of the things that it um, did a lot of uh, false detections on is in this area, like small 
uh, areas of snow got detected as building. And there was also a lot of buildings out in the ocean. So the reason that the AI uh, has a trouble here is most likely due to the fact that there are no images of this in our data set. We are only adding images where there are at least 5% buildings. So this kind of nature is never seen by the AI. OK, so that's how we started out. We created a training data set from our sample space. We had our 5% buildings rule. We got a model that was uh, really good in densely populated areas, but had more trouble in rural areas. So we wanted to continue making things better both making the bot model better and making it, or uh, getting it to have a better general under understanding of both building and background. Uh, but we also wanted better handling of the data. So let's look at some of the problems with what we've been doing. So first of all, with our sample space, we have a very limited selection of data. We're only fetching data from that part of Norway. We also have a limited variation of nature, because we're only looking at areas that are covered with at least 5% buildings. And we're also saving a lot of redundant data. So we're creating these small tiles of data that is already saved in our databases. And it takes up a lot of space. And it's also what I will call, will call unchangeable. If something was updated in our aerial images or in our buildings database, we would have to create an entirely new data set to get that change into our training data. If we wanted to change our uh, criteria for when to create training data, we would have to create an entirely new data set, and so on. If we wanted to add a different input uh, source, for example. So the data is unchangeable and kind of redundant. So we have three challenges that we want to solve. One is that we want to avoid saving all this redundant data. We want to support adjustable data criteria, not just looking at the 5% buildings rule. And we want to support adjustable data sources, because there might be other types of data that would also be, um, be good to be able to detect buildings. OK, so let's start looking at the first one. So we talked to this other company. And instead of pre-generating their data, they created a data stream. And we found this idea very intriguing. So what if we could stream the data directly to the AI model instead of pre-generating it? So this would mean that we would have to create data on the fly while training the model. So instead of creating this big training data set that is downloaded to our computer, we instead create our data samples, we pass it to the AI, and then we can just delete the data afterwards, all in memory. So for this to make sense, we have a very important requirement. Data must flow so fast that the AI doesn't have to wait. So we need to be sure that we are creating training data samples as fast as the model is processing data. So for the computer that we're training on, that would mean 24 images every second. And this is actually the same frame rate as movies in a cinema. So this is, it's pretty fast. So we need to create data, um, data very fast for this to make sense. And just for reference, um, this is then trained on, <laughs> or the computer that we're training on and that this uh, data is t taken from is a Titan GPU with 12 gigabytes memory. So it's, not a, uh, it's a pretty lightweight computer. So if we're not able to do it this fast, then it really doesn't make any sense. OK, so let's look at our data flow again. First of all, we get rid of our sample space, and we start looking at all of Norway. And instead of having our training data generator, we introduce a sample generator. And the sample generator looks at uh, random tiles across Norway. And it produces a data sample. This data sample is then um, pushed into our sample queue. And from there, it goes into either a training data reservoir or a validation data reservoir. And further, it's pushed into a queue of batch data that can then be read by the AI so that the AI can train on that data. So 
for this to work, we need some multiprocessing, and we wanted to do this in Python, just on, our, uh, on the computer that we're training on locally. But Python doesn't have real threading. Well, Python can start several processes. And each process has separate memory, separate interpreters, and it can communicate over synchronized share memory and queue. So our sample generator can be one process. The training data reservoir can be another. The validation, a third. And our AI model can run in a fourth process. And then data can flow through these processes with the shared memory in the queues. So this is pretty cool. So this is a way that we can avoid saving all the redundant data and just let the data flow through into our AI model. OK, so problem number two. We want to support adjustable data criteria. So we have this 5% buildings rule, which it makes sense because we want to focus on buildings. So since we have these multiprocesses, we might as well just add another sample generator with a different rule. So we can add one that looks for areas with 20% buildings to make sure that we get areas that are very densely populated, which will be a bit different than the 5% rule. And then maybe the most important addition, a sample generator that looks for areas without buildings, so that we're sure that we get some nature in there as well. And this can then flow through to the sample queue and so on. But if all of these sample generators were allowed to just push data as soon as they found something that matched its criteria, what would happen? Well, we would get all of this data again. Because the no buildings generator would process data way faster than the other ones. So we need some kind of filter. So we add what we called a multiplexer, which allows us to add a weight or a fraction that each of the sample generators are allowed to fill our training data with. So we can then say that only 10% of our training data can be filled from the sample generator looking for no buildings. So in this way, we can both make sure that we're getting different type of data, but we can also control how much of that data we're filling our training data with. OK, so challenge number three, we want to support adjustable data sources. So this is kind, kind of already solved. So now we're creating data while we're training the model. So if we changed a data source, we could just uh, create a sample generator that could read from that data source instead, and the data would flow through, and we could train a model on that data instead. So this, this is pretty, pretty well supported now. Great, we've got our training rig. Not so fast. I mentioned that we need to make sure that the data is flowing fast enough. So how fast is this data stream? Well, the 5% buildings rule sample generator keeps missing, right? So it's looking for data, and it doesn't match its criteria. And this takes time. So if we're looking at how many samples each of these generators are actually producing, the numbers aren't that fun. It's 0.14 samples per minute. It's extremely slow. The 20% buildings, even worse. And the no buildings, it's a little bit better, but it's still, still not that much. So in total, that would mean 0.22 samples per second. It's pretty far off from the 24 that we need. So we need to figure out how to make it faster. So action number one. We need to perform less of the expensive client server calls. So for each of the checks that we're doing to, to figure out if a tile has buildings, we connect to our Azure database, we create an image of that area with buildings, and we figure out how much of that area is covered by building. An expensive process. So we need a better way to determine if a tile has buildings or not, and it needs to be super fast. So what we did was that we pre-calculated a building area by creating a buffer around all the existing buildings. So a buffer is that you create a polygon around an object that contains all points within a certain distance. So if you create a buffer around these buildings of 10 meters, it would look like this. So we did this for all buildings in Norway, which gave us uh, a, an area of buildings, like what part of Norway is covered by buildings. 
And, that, and it looks like the image to the right here, which is kind of funny because it just looks like a map of Norway, right? And the reason is that we have buildings along the coast and along our roads, so it, it just looks like Norway. <laughs> And this was added to an SQLite database that we had locally on our machine, which is small, it's very fast, and it's self-contained, meaning it has few dependencies. And the total layer of this building area is only 400 megabytes. So now, instead of going directly to the Azure database, we ask the SQLite database first, is this tile within or outside of our building area? If it's outside, then we know that it won't be covered by 5% buildings. And we don't need to ask Azure how many buildings are there here. We can just stop there and continue to the next tile. If it's within our building area, then we can ask Azure about what buildings are there and then create the label and do our calculations. And this is much faster. So we go from having 0.14 samples per minute to 3 samples per minute. And the other ones are also improving. The no buildings aren't improving that much because it, it wasn't um, getting wrong tiles all the time. So this is, this is a lot better than what we had. But it's still not close to good enough. OK, so action number two. We need to make use of parallel processes and multiple, multiple connections to our databases. So we already have our parallel processes with sample generators looking for different types of data. So we might as well just add more sample generators that can look for the same type of data. So we add up to 40 different parallel sample generators that can all connect to the databases and look for data that we want. Woohoo! We got our improved training rig. Or do we? If we multiply up, we still only have 5.5 samples per second. So we're not really there. So we need another action. Oh, well, yeah, this is just the calculations. We need to allow reuse of data. So when working with the pre-generated data, we already do this. We use the same data for each iteration of training. So reusing data in machine learning is, is very common. So this isn't really a problem. But we need to make sure that in the beginning of training, when there's not that much data available, the, uh, the AI can't see the same type of data again and again um, from, from the beginning. That wouldn't work. So we need to add a minimum level of data to our data reservoir before we are allowed to start training. Otherwise, it would see the same data over and over again, and it would overfit, meaning it would just memorize those instances of data. So we add the minimum level, and then we can allow reuse up to, for example, 10 times. And after those 10 times when the data is used, we just delete it. And we always prioritize the least used data. So if the data is flowing in fast enough, we just delete the ones that we have already used many times if we reach our max level. OK, so where do we end up now? Well, we said we had 5.5 samples per second. So if we are allowing reuse of um, 10 times, it gives us 55 samples, which is more than 25. So finally, we have something that is fast enough. But I also said that what we're training on uh, is not that it doesn't have that much compute power. So what if we scaled up? What if we wanted to train on um, train in the cloud, for example, with a lot of GPU power? Well, we could just incre increase our allowed reuse and increase our minimum level of data before we start training, and it would still be fine. So this actually scales. OK, now we're getting somewhere. So let's summarize. How did we get our optimal training rig? Well, we created an in-memory stream of data. We, we are using parallel processes in Python. And we made it fast enough by adding multiple sample generators, by creating this building buffer area in a local database so that we could fast figure out if a tile has buildings or not. And we allowed reuse of data. So let's look at the difference between an AI that is trained on this pre-generated data and on the stream data. 
So we had our, uh, our test area in Balsfield, and we can see that we in increase our true detections from 77 to 88%. And we go down to 187 false buildings. So this is, is a good improvement, even though we do want it even better. <laughs> even better. So let's look at some of the data. So here I've added the, the new model on, on top of the old one, and you can see that it's covering more or less the same area, but there are some differences. Here, for example, is some kind of terrace, which both of the models falsely predict as part of the building, but the new one is a little bit better. It <laughs> covers a smaller part of the area. And here is a building that the old model didn't recognize, but the new one did, and here as well. But we also have a building that the first model recognized and the second didn't. So it's more or less the same in these um, populated areas. And here are some more examples of um, wrongly detected buildings by the first model that the second model was better at. So there's a trampoline of some sort, and yeah. But there's also one building here that the first model actually detected correctly and the second missed. But one of the biggest problems was these rural areas. And here we can really see a difference. So a lot of the buildings that were falsely detected by the first model is not, no longer detected as buildings. And we got rid of all the buildings out in the ocean. OK, so it's demo time. Let's see if we can start a training process. OK, so I'm going to run this in debug mode, because then you can see all the processes, which is quite fun. So I'm just going to start a training process, because that that's what we're calling it, even though it's also generating data. And I'm adding the minimum level of the training reservoir just to one, because then we can start training at once. So this is just for demo purposes. I have a batch size of two, because I'm just running it on my computer. <laughs> And we can reuse data 10 times. And we're running 100 training batches and 10 validation batches. And we're using a configuration file, um, which is called Multiplex Building Norway. So let's look into what that is. OK, so this is a configuration file that tells us uh, what kind of sample generators we want. So here we're saying that we want the no buildings rule, and we want two processes, and we want it to be 10% of our training data. We then have the 20% building rules with uh, 15 processes and 30% of the data, and then the 5% rule with 23 processes and 60% of our data. So this is what we're going to um, spin up now. OK. You can also see that TensorFlow is starting, which is the framework that we're using for our AI model. OK, so here we have all our processes. Can I get this higher? No. OK, yeah. So one of these processes is our AI model. Another one is the training data reservoir. And then there are all the sample generators. So all of these are running now in parallel, trying to find data and training our model. So for the purpose of this demo, we're also caching our data so that we can see what is being downloaded. OK, so let's see if there are, yeah, OK, data is coming in. Good. So let's see what is being created here. So this is the minimum 5% buildings rule. Yeah, so it's finding data with buildings. And it's increasing. And then the 20% buildings rule. Yeah, so this is areas more, oh, this is probably false, falsely an, an area that has changed according, it's different from what is in the data set probably. But this is a densely populated area with 20% buildings and see, yeah, this one as well. And then the no buildings, this should be like forest, yeah. 
more forest, ocean. Yeah, so now we can see that we're actually getting the different type of types of data that we want. And soon the AI will also start running and a training on this downloaded or created data. OK, so let's just keep that running a little bit. OK, so what are the benefits of this stream data rig? Well, we have a better general understanding of buildings when we're training on um, this type of data. We can train on way more data without needing all the disk space. And we can easier change uh, and add new data sources without having to create training data all over again. And we can immediately start training a new model on new data because we don't have to first create a training data and then start training. So how can we, we take advantage of the new training rate? So this, we just finished this like a month ago, so we're very excited to start testing it on different, kind of, uh, different cases. So one obvious one is using height data. We've already done this when we've been working with the pre-generated data, so we, we know that this works pretty well. So you can add height data as well as the aerial images to improve the detection of buildings. We can also use infrared images, which has some more information than the RGB images. We can also use oblique images, which, which are aerial images taken from the side so that buildings are often way more visible. And we can create models, models that detect other types of objects, not just buildings, but roads or pipes and everything else. OK, so let's see if our model has started training. Yeah, it has. OK, good. So for those of you who aren't familiar with training these types of model, what you're looking for is that the loss should go down while it's training. And I'm not going to explain why. You just have to trust me. <laughs> but yeah, so we can see that the loss, the loss is going down, and the AI has started learning how to predict the buildings. It's probably not any good, <laughs> but it's starting to see some systems that, that make sense. So this could then just run and run and run until we see that it has stopped learning and it's kind of reached its maximum level of training data that it needs to be as good as it can get. So that was the demo. I'll stop this, otherwise my computer gets angry. OK, so the last thing I want to say is that if any of you are planning on building something illegally, you better be creative on how your rooftop looks like. Otherwise, the AI will come and find you. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> are there any questions? Yeah, good question. So uh, she's asking if we could use data augmentation to increase the number of images that we're using. So we definitely discussed this. Uh, but since uh, reuse and the other actions kind of made it fast enough for us, we didn't do any of that yet. But yeah, we could definitely add like a flip of the images or changed orientation as maybe part of the reuse. I'm not sure if we would make things better since we already have so much training data. But yeah, to, to make it faster, we definitely could have done that. Yeah? Why did you have the requirement of 24 images per second? Uh, the requirement of 24 images per second was due to that, uh, that's the um, speed our AI model was reading images when it was training on the machine that we're using. Yeah, if the data is not fast enough, the AI is, uh, will just go into a sleeping mode, and it will wait for data to be available, and then it will start fetching the data again. So yeah, it's, it, just, uh, it will just wait until more data is available if it's not fast enough. 
Yeah. Okay, yeah, so the question is where are the images coming from? Yeah, um, these images are uh, a part of um, like a national data set that Nurkac uh, is buying. So we are one of many people or um, companies that have access to these images. So the munici municipalities have these images as well as other that are paying for them. Yeah, good question. So the question is, how do we avoid overfitting if we are allowing a lot of reuse of our data? So it's the main thing is that we need to increase the minimum level of uh, um, the amount of data that we have before we start training. And if we, oh, how should I explain this? <laughs> if you have enough data in your reservoir before you start allowing reuse, the data flow that is coming in will make uh, the amount of data so high that you won't have to reuse the data very often. So the, um, the, um, the time before each reuse will be high enough that it will kind of be the same as if you're training on a um, static data set and reusing on each epoch. So we're kind of, uh, we're setting the um, minimum level and amount of data to a point where it would kind of be the same as or the, um, the reuse will mostly happen across different epochs, not within one. Yeah? Uh, okay, so the, the shared memories are um, it's, uh, just a Python definition. Um, I'm not sure how to explain them, because I don't know that well how they work. But you can create the multiprocess um, um, just by using a command, and the same with the, with the shared memory. And then that shared memory is accessible for all the processes. I'm not sure if that was a good explanation, but. Uh, you shared data. So the samples are uh, saved to the queues, and then all the processes are allowed to fetch data from that queue. Yeah, exactly. It's not. It's not the GPU memory. No, it's the, just the sa the data samples that are shared. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. So she's asking about the false negatives, since I only talked about the false positives. So false negatives is also definitely a case. Um, both because some buildings are just not recognized by the AI, but we also have the problem of not all buildings being visible in the images. So in the beginning, we were thinking of also uh, allowing the municipalities to find buildings that were demolished, but the error rate was too big, so it wouldn't make sense to ask them to go through that data. So until our model is better, we're not really um, using that as a part of our analysis. Uh, but it's it's also because a lot of buildings just aren't visible in in the images uh, by just looking at um, the like from straight um, on top of the images. So that's why we're starting to use the oblique images because then you can see the image or the building from the side from all um, winkler angles, <laughs> and then m most likely the building will will be visible at least from one of those, those angles. I didn't hear everything that you said, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah? Um, did you consider, um, due to maybe changes in nature across the land, to have a more locally fit model uh, for different regions? 
Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, if we considered having locally fitted models. We definitely uh, have this in our backlog of things we want to test. See if it is better to create a model that is good on the south of Norway and a different model that is good in the north of uh, Norway. So we haven't been able to test this yet, but I um, I think it might be a better better choice because once we're training on the data for all of Norway, the model doesn't get that much better, even though it kind of should because it, get, it gets more data. But the problem of defining buildings across all of, all of Norway is also a more difficult problem. So it might be better to say that, OK, you, you only need to focus on the south of Norway, and another model can focus on other parts of Norway. Yeah? Yeah, good question. Summer model and winter model. Well, since we ha only use aerial images, we only have images taken from a certain part of the, um, the year anyways. But if we were to move on to satellite uh, data, that would be really interesting. And especially if you're thinking of road detection. In fact, I think roads might be more visible in the winter than in the summer, because then there's snow everywhere else. So I think maybe not with buildings, but with other types of detections, that would be really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering, uh, you said that, or I think the goal was that a person either accepts or rejects the model output. Uh, are they also allowed to, to make changes to the output? Yeah, good question. Are they allowed to change the output, not just say building or not building? Yeah, so the point of our uh, the web application is that they're saving the buildings that they want to kind of look more into. And when they're actually adding those buildings to the municipality's data set, they're drawing it themselves. Because the prediction and the form isn't really that good. So it's better for them to just start from scratch. Yeah. On that same note, do you should we use both the heat vector and the build tool to then kind of like reduce both positive? Because then you know which one saves the heat and kind of what you use that. Yeah. Good question. So are we reusing um, the data from when the municipalities have gone through and deleted and saved uh, predictions? So uh, we haven't done any of that for training, but the changes that they are doing are going into the data sets that, are, that we are using to label our data. And since we're now streaming the data, every, uh, every time the municipality adds a change, the next time we train, we will get that change into our data when we're just streaming. So we kind of get the data updated through that. But uh, we're also thinking that when we're uh, running predictions for the same municipality several times, we can also reuse the buildings that they have deleted. So if we're detecting the same building over and over again, and the municipality is deleting it over and over again, that's unnecessary. So we can kind of just delete the buildings that they have already had predicted in a previous year and then delete it for them. Yeah? Uh, have you tried out uh, transfer learning techniques? Yeah, so the question is if we've used transfer learning, but n yeah, then we haven't tested any of that. Uh, where the, the model is uh, saved? Yes, when you have trained it, it's ready to be used. Yeah, yeah. Then it's saved uh, on uh, on our uh, on the disk on our computer. Yeah. What is the size of the trained model? Oh, uh, not sure, but it's small. It's only some megabytes, I think. I, I can double check that, but it's uh, it's very easy to move around. That's why I know that it's not too big. <laughs> I think that was it. Thank you.